Hey, how's it going? Professor Ramon here. Uh, this time the topic is local and general anesthesia. So let's just jump right into it. Uh, let's take a look at those words. Local and general. Uh, consider the, what these terms mean when something is local versus general. We use this term in steroids, like a local steroid versus a systemic or a general steroid. So if you're talking of a medication that's going to be uh, affecting generally or systemically, that's the whole body for pentatone while a localized medication is going to be something that's going to be to a particular region of the body. So in that case, I was saying steroids can be a localized steroid or a systemic steroid. In this case, anesthesia. Anesthesia can be a localized anesthesia or a general anesthesia. So we either going to uh, numb a particular region of the body. Like, for example, if we numb, like with a nerve block, and you numb the nerve completely with a drug and everything beyond that nerve now becomes completely numb. That would be a nerve block, that medication would be lidocaine. So look at how lidocaine can be injected directly into a nerve to cause a nerve block. That would be a local anesthetic, right? Or you can have lidocaine topical, because like a gel, and if you put it on the surface of the skin and you rub it in, it numbs that area of the skin. Uh, you might have seen this like when they start IVs on people that are very sensitive. They'll numb the skin and then you can put the IV on. Uh, that's also topical lidocaine. Uh, lidocaine can also come in the oral form. Look at the same drug. So on an oral form, I've seen it as a gel, like aura gel for children that are starting to teeth. You put the gel on the, on the gums and the percentage of the lidocaine is very low. It's low enough to cause enough numbness for a baby to help them with the teething. But it's not a high enough percentage that it's going to start to numb the throat and cause issues with uh, swallowing, like high risk, high risk of, uh, of aspiration. In this case, though, the, let me see. the Another form, lidocaine can be given as a viscous lidocaine, and it's like a gel, and you have the patient swallow it. This is when we have patients that come into the emergency department and say that they're coming in with heartburn. Heartburn that I've been having times three days. Well, this could not be heartburn. This might be a heart attack. So to differentiate between the heart attack and the heart burn, they might give you the very same drug, lidocaine. But this time as a gel, and you swallow it, and it numbs the esophagus, high risk of aspiration, but that's okay, because now we're going to numb all of the esophagus and numb the stomach. Once all the stomach is numb, the pain goes away, hey, it was heartburn. But let's run some cardiac enzymes, and let's put you on an EKG anyways to see if it wasn't a heart attack. That should help rule it out. But if the pain does not go away, this might actually be a heart attack, and that's where the cardiac enzymes and the EKG come in. So again, look at how it's the very same drug, lidocaine. Lidocaine injected into a nerve. Lidocaine injected into the skin, and then they can be uh, stitches. Or lidocaine into the gums, and now they can pull out a tooth. Or lidocaine orally, or lidocaine swallowed. There's also lidocaine that can be given intravenously, IV. So once you give it IV, it numbs the heart from the inside out because it's a sodium channel blocker. That's, that's how it gives its effects. It's a sodium channel blocker. So in this case, for people that have heart attacks, you know how a heart attack can be, a dysrhythmia can be either the heart is going too fast or the heart is going too slow. For those dysrhythmias where the heart is going too fast, they might have to give lidocaine IV to numb the heart and get it to slow down just a little bit. Look at that. The very same drug, very different forms and the effect is either a numbing or a slowing down. You see that? So that's going to be the very first um, uh, prototype drug I believe you have for this chapter, and it's on page 267, lidocaine, also known as xylocaine. So let's continue with that since that's how I kind of kicked off the, the subject matter here. Kill me with a little bit of allergies. I don't know if you can hear me wheeze a little bit. Uh, lidocaine, xylocaine. Look at the therapeutic class, anesthetic. Lidocaine, it could be topical. Look at how it says antidysrhythmic. Yeah, a 1B. Don't worry about the classes. We'll get into that when we get to that chapter. But you just start remembering now, lidocaine, that's one of those drugs in the crash cart that comes IV for heart attacks that are too fast. Which ones? We'll get there. We'll get there. So right now, just remember lidocaine. So it comes in many different forms, many different uses as an antidysrhythmic or an anti anesthetic, which is what we're talking about. Pharmacological class, science talk, sodium channel blocker. So. Once you start blocking sodium channels, what is the effect? Numbness and a decrease in, in activity, and particularly in the heart. You see that? So down at the bottom, lidoc actions and uses. <clears throat> lidocaine, the most frequently used injectable local anesthetic. So local, look at what it says in the next one. Block, 
because you can actually inject it into a nerve to do a nerve block. It keeps going and it says nerve blocks. Uh, spinal or epidural anesthesias. Look, at you can do a lidocaine patch to numb that area of the skin. Uh, sometimes for tattoos, that's cheating, right? Where's the fun of that? Or if you have a tattoo, you got to go through the pain, right? What else do we have? Uh, uh, for post-herpatic neuroglia, lidoderm. So people that have herpes, but the shingles type, and it hurts really bad, you'll take a cyclovir for, to try to get the virus to control. But the pain that you get from the shingles, they'll give you a lidocaine patch that you can put to decrease the pain a little bit. A little bit further down, what else does it say? There's intradermal, yes. So there's a difference. Infiltration refers to when the drug gets into the tissue. So in this case, we're purposefully infiltrating with a syringe with lidocaine and you're just puncturing the skin and, in, and infusing it directly into the skin. You're numbing the area, for example, stitches. So if, if you ever cut yourself, I've had a few cuts that have required switch stitches over the years, they'll inject it all into the skin. That's an infiltration of lidocaine to numb the area regionally and now they can sew it and manipulate it. See that? We keep going. I'm still on actions and uses lidocaine, page 267. Second paragraph, lidocaine might be given intravenously, intramuscularly, subcutaneously for dysrhythmias. Chapter 30, we'll get there. Topical forms are also available. Mouthwash, rid, wash, rinses, helps with pain associated with throat ulcerations. You see that? Lidocaine, common compound in antacids, antibiotics. Uh, etc. Uh, don't forget viscous lidocaine to rule out heart attack versus heartburn, step one. Sometimes called the green cocktail or the green lady cocktail, which is a, some sort of an anticholinergic. Viscous lidocaine and Maalox all mixed up into one and then chug love. And it numbs the throat, it numbs the stomach. And if the uh, pain goes away, good. Let's confirm EKG, cardiac enzymes, everything's good. Cool, you're good to go discharge. Uh, if it doesn't go in and the EKG and the, and the cardiac enzymes looks bad, you got a heart attack on your hands. So that's a whole other story. So viscous lidocaine, but it will numb the throat. You're going to cause a high risk of aspiration, but it's the lesser of two evils because you're trying to rule out a heart attack. So, of course, you keep them in the ER until it wears off, and then you discharge them. NPO, once you give somebody viscous lidocaine to swallow, NPO, NPO status, which means NPO, nothing by mouth. Nothing Latin for nothing by mouth. That's why I look black box warning viscous lidocaine among infants leads to ingestion, uh, excessive amounts administered infants accidentally swallowed too much seizures, brain injuries, cardiac abnormalities and death. That's the that's the origin. So you always want to not just look at the lidocaine but look at the percentage because here look at what it says for the dosages. It doesn't. It just says onset, peak, duration. But where's your dosages? Because it comes in percent. So look at at the top. It's talking to 2%. And the black box warning talks about a 2% viscous lidocaine. But there's different percentages depending on the routes and the uses. So keep that in mind. Sodium channel blocker lidocaine. It will be in your career for the rest of your life as a nurse. But let's go to the beginning of the chapter. Because holy smokes, we just jumped right into the swimming pool there, right? Page 263. We were talking about local anesthetics versus, uh, what else is that? Yeah, that's two of them here. Local anesthesia versus a local anesthetic. It's just differentiating between are you doing a nerve block to a region or to a surface of the skin, I believe. So let's look at that picture down at the bottom because I like that because this little gal right here shows you all the different routes that you can go for administering something like lidocaine because we just read about all the different routes that you can go. So look at letter A. It's that gal with her arm up in the air showing you the posterior end. A, look at how there's a little gel on her hand right there. If you look closely, you see that? That's topical. So that's one way you can give a local anesthetic, right? Look at how now that arrow jumps into her mouth. You see that? Now the, the picture of her up close with the two syringes in her mouth. Look at letter B, nerve block. So look, if you look at the edge of the needle, on the syringe, it's literally inside the nerve that's going into the uh, temporal mandibular. It must be the temporal mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve. You see that? So once you inject this, the lidocaine directly into that nerve, everything beyond that is going to go numb. Does that make sense? Because no more impulses are going to come in 
from, from that nerve ending. <clears throat> that's a nerve, that's a nerve block. Letter C is the infiltration. So now they're injecting it all into the tissues of the actual gum. Yikes, that hurts. And they inject it and then everything goes numb. So that's infiltrating. That's the same as on stitches. And you just inject it into the skin. That's an infiltration. That's C. Hold on, Mama. Look it down at the bottom now. We're getting into the arrow that goes into the spine. And this is where I got to introduce you to your mother. <laughs> your hard mother and your soft mother. Yeah, you have a hard mother and a soft mother. Did you know that? So look at right down there. Look at the close-up of the spine. <clears throat> and it gets bigger. Look at where you have D and E. <clears throat> we'll get to that part. But look at those three other terms with the lines. Look at the term Pia Mata and Dura Mata. So Mata is Latin for mother. And Pia means soft and Dura means hard. So you have a hard mother and you have a soft mother. Both of them cradle the brain and the spinal cord. The soft one on the inside, identify Pia Mata, right on the inside. Then there's the spider web, the arachnoid space. And then after the arachnoid space, the dura mater, the hard mother on the inside. So it's brain and spinal cord, soft mother, spider webs, hard mother. So anything below the hard mother, that space, that's going to be subdural space. You see that? Subdura, under the hard, subdural space, subdural hematomas, subdural anesthetics you see that versus now let's look at the terms e and d e saying epidural ah outside of the dura epidural dura the hard mother outside of the hard mother epidurals that's a different cavity that's a different space so look at where the epidural is going outside of the hard mother and then of course there's spinal but spinal can also be put i want you to write it in your book there subdural because it is under the hard mother that is into the subdural space on letter D. So look at that, a quick refresher on your anatomy. And I bet you didn't know, did you remember you have a soft mother and a hard mother? So I call it the soft mother and your hard mother. <laughs> so both of them take care of you, right? They both cradle in there, right? Good, good. Keep on moving to the next page. Down at the bottom, I like 264 at the bottom. It just explains the mechanism of action on the molecular level with the sodium channel blocking effects of lidocaine. So I'll let you read that on your own only for time's sake because I don't want these videos to get too long. I don't know if I'm holding people's attention and, and I'm fine tuning my approach. Trust me, I'll give you some production. Right now, I'm just hitting the ground running to give you guys what you need, but I'll give you some more production effort on these videos. Uh, let's see, uh, page 264. What do we got up at the top? There you go, the different routes. Topical, infiltration, the nerve block, the spinal anesthesia, and the epidural anesthesia. So look on the right-hand side. Obviously, the epidurals, it, once you infiltrate right there, everything below the spine is going to go down. You see that? <clears throat> so look at how we have the different formulations for each one. I'm not going to hit you too much with that, but just know the different routes. And then it just gives you the descriptions of how the drugs affect based on those. So it's a great table. I'll let you read that on your own for time's sake. Uh, I like that table down at the bottom of 265, 19.2, selective anesthetic, local anesthetics. So it divides them into the classes, the esters, the amides, and then miscellaneous. Don't think I'm going to hit you too hard with the what the chemical classifications. It's more the names, but just so that you know how, they, how they're in different groups. You see that? Uh, in particularly, let's see, I'm starting from the top. Look at how they all aimed in cane, benzocaine. Chloroprocaine, procaine, novocaine. That's I'm sure some of you are familiar with novocaine. Uh, look at propracaine, ophthalmic. Technically, that's cocaine as liquid eye drops to numb the eyes for certain types of glaucomas and surgeries and uh, other issues of the eyes. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm wheezing a little bit. I'm sorry about that. I am. I'm dealing with some allergies. Let's see. The second category, the amines. Uh, lidocaine is going to be, there you go, your, your, your uh, prototype drug, and we've already talked about it, and the different forms that it can be used. You see that? This drug will come up again and again in several other chapters. Uh, cool. That's the main things you need to know there. Turn the page, 266, no problem there. It's like gets you down to the molecular level and the differences between the esters and the amines. Lidocaine and procaine, 
it's just showing you the difference in the molecular structures of each one of them but uh and the little section that is different between the two that makes one one and one the other uh if you're interested in things at that level uh no problem there we already talked about lidocaine on 267 nursing practice i'm going to look over but then over on page 270 so now we're getting into general anesthetics so that was everything having to do with a particular area but now what if we need to shut down the entire body top to bottom so there are different types and look at the top of page 270 table 19.3 stages of general anesthesia so stage one so we begin to sedate you boom so we're going to get you out because of surgery so stage one you're starting to lose pain and the patient's general sensation might be awake stage press proceed until the patient loses uh, loses consciousness. So now you're going into the stages of general anesthesia. So this is for the purposes of major surgery. So they're gonna open you up, you're gonna be on a ventilator. <clears throat> major anesthesia like this requires a ventilator. You can't be put under anesthesia without an anesthesiologist and a ventilator. So that somebody is monitoring just that. And of course they have the reversal agents and their set of vitals and the whole book that they're taking on keeping an eye on look at level two excitation and hyperactivity the patient may be delirious tries to resist a little bit of treatment it goes further down stage three surgical anesthesia so it's not until stage three that you get down to that level where now you're out so i think the level two is when you start singing ah what if god was one of us while <laughs> they're wheeling you down the hall and then stage three is when you're officially out and ready to be so that they can begin the procedure right so this is where skeletal muscles become paralyzed ah right here so there's going to be there's particular medications of choice that they'll choose for this because it's well researched they already know the effects of it they already know the reversal agents they already know all of the effectiveness and adverse effects to to expect so there's particular drugs already specified or or, or um in formularies to use for it look at level four now you've got paralysis of the medulla of the brain responsible for controlling respiratory and cardiovascular see death could result this is why you need the ventilator right here so you could plunge down to those levels of sedation really on anything if you start taking a, a benzodiazepine or a valium or something to that effect but that's the levels that things progress before your brain actually shuts down and stops breathing altogether so interesting, the first drug I'm very, very familiar with, down at the bottom of page 270, your first prototype drug that's a general anesthetic, propofol. Propofol, also called Deprovan, also known as milk of amnesia. This stuff will put you out, but this is a very unique drug, and I'll tell you why I'm very familiar with it. Um, as a side note, this is the drug that Michael Jackson died of because this was administered to him by a doctor in the home setting and right there the doctor's guilty and i'm glad he lost his license propofol is never used outside of a, of a facility because the facility needs to have a crash cart a respirator and people qualified to know how to use that to to, to bring you back that's the, the 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 requirements for the use of this drug because that's how heavy it sedates you because that's what it's for so right off the bat, to be administering this outside of the hospital, to prescribe propofol, to, no, no such thing. You can't because it requires a vent and a crash cart and people that know how to use those. Let me tell you why. This is a great drug, though. Propofol looks like milk. That's why they call it milk of amnesia. <laughs> milk of amnesia because it puts you out, you know. Uh, propofol looks like milk. It's a, it's a, it's a white-looking drug. You give it IV. So you need to make sure you have a good patent IV. Usually it's going to be a central line that they're going to put them out. It will knock you out completely, but the half-life is extremely short. How short? You know that bell curve, remember how we go the first half and the second half, absorption and then excretion, right? Well, that half-life is very short. It's so short that it is it will only work as you continuously infuse it. So in order to keep you knocked out, it needs to be continually be given. And this is fantastic for patients in the neuro ICU, which is why I'm familiar with this drug. In the neuro ICU, it's fantastic because you can shut it off and the patient starts to wake up and they're connected to a ventilator. And before they freak out, you shine the light in their eye, 
you do your quick neuro checks because usually you got a, a clipboard that says you got to do neuro checks every four to six hours. So you, you turn off the drug. They literally wake up. You do your neuro checks really quick, turn the drug back on, and they go right back out. That's how much of a short life that propofol have that I have even seen because I've managed it. I used to work neuro ICU at Herman Memorial, Houston, Texas, many years ago. Um, and this was the drug that they used to keep people in close head injuries, craniotomies, induced comas for neuro, neuro injuries. Because neuro requires a lot of time for the brain swelling to go down. So they got to keep you unconscious for all that time. So propofol is fantastic for neuro reasons of giving somebody an anesthetic. But it can be used for other types of anesthesia. Uh, uh, procedures for anesthesia, right? So look at what it says. So it is a general anesthetic, so it knocks you out completely. Look at the pharmacological class. Yeah, NMDA receptor agonist. So it's a particular enzyme receptor agonist. That's how it puts you down. NMDA. I believe it's one of the few in this whole class, but don't quote me on that. Look at the actions. Propofol has become the widest used IV anesthetic due to the effectiveness relatively safe profile literally it wears off that quickly so that's pretty good you know but at the same time that can knock you out it, it makes you think that it's that safe but you got to have it inside a facility propofol is indicated for the induction and maintenance of general anesthesia it has almost an immediate onset of action yeah and used for conscious sedation circle that word conscious sedation so there's number region or there's knock you out completely because we're about to do a surgery on you or whatever conscious sedation is a little something in between there are certain drugs that they can give you to not knock you out 100 percent that you actually need a respirator and a crash card or you conscious sedation you still need a crash card but you don't have to get connected to a breathing machine general anesthesia breathing machine Conscious sedation, eh, halfway in between. So what kind of drugs do we give for conscious sedation? Benadryl IV, Valium IV, Versed IV, Propofol apparently and probably in smaller doses, just a little IV push, just a little, which is probably what that doctor was trying to do probably with Michael Jackson in the home. Just little quick little spike, little boluses, just little tap, tap, little taps. That's dangerous though, very dangerous. Uh, so what was my point? Conscious sedation. So those are drugs that can be used to keep you in between. Why would somebody want to keep you in between? Colonoscopies, bronchoscopies, certain uh, procedures like some people to pull out a tooth like nitrous oxide. That's a conscious sedation. You kind of have to in between. Pacemaker insertions, dislocated shoulder, reset it. I'm just pulling out of my memory from experience. But those are things that could require a conscious sedation. So not fully, completely out on a breathing machine. That's general. This is, for the most part, general. But apparently, to your book, it can be used for, for conscious sedation. I've never heard of it for that. But that, again, it's been years since I've been in the clinical setting. So this is probably something that's kind of newer. Propofol has an anti-emetic effect. Emetic, em emesis. Emesis means vomiting. So anti-emetic, it decreases vomiting. Yeah, because it affects the, the, the vomiting centers, the noxious centers in the brain. So I could see how it's affecting. That's why we say that it's great for neuro checks as well. So look at the pregnancy category B. Yeah, it's relatively safe. But that's your concern. So yeah, look at the treatment for overdose. Overdose will pr produce cardiac and respiratory depression. Treatment includes mechanical ventilation, increasing the flow rate of IV fluids, and administering vasopressor agents as needed to maintain blood pressure. So like that, right? Just say it's